So, anyone who's got a device that can record, feel free to start recording because we want to create a mashup of all the videos and create a, a nice um, story of the whole event. But anyway, it's now my great pleasure to introduce Baba Brinkman, who I've known now for, I don't know, about four or five years. First met him when he was doing uh, the Canterbury Tales in rap, and I introduced him to some. Him to some Chaucer scholars who are working at the University of Birmingham using phylogenetic methods to classify Chaucer manuscripts. Um, and they told him he'd used completely the wrong manuscript for his rap guide to, to Chaucer. Uh, but uh, and then a, a short while after that, I was preparing for the uh, Darwin Bicentenary in writing the rough guide to evolution. And I said to Baba, well, why don't you do for Darwin what you did for Chaucer and create the rap guide to evolution? And um, there was also an event, a poetic event, that was uh, scheduled, uh, organised by Darwin's great-great-grandson, Randall Keynes. And um, he rose to the, to the challenge and actually produced the rap guide to evolution, I think in a matter of about three months or something. And since then, he's actually lived off it, gone around the world, performed in four or five continents. And... Uh, performed off-Broadway, he's won funding from the uh, Wellcome Trust to actually make uh, exciting videos to uh, accompany the, the, the Rap Guide to Evolution. He managed to rope me into starring in one of them. And uh, he also got the, origin we got the originator of the Out of Africa theory to star in the Rap video, although we couldn't integrate him into the body of it. If you go and look at one of those videos, the one about the out of Africa theory, I'm in Africa, and you'll find uh, Chris Stringer at the very end of that. Anyway, I'll stop prattling on and just say that Barbara has come all the way from New York City, especially for this event. He's flown over on a red eye. He's going to go back tomorrow morning very, very early. He's performing in Yale tomorrow. So I think we ought to welcome him with, a, with open arms and particularly focus on the fact that he's going to include a little bit of material about the rap guide to infection. It's not going to be a full show about infection, it's going to include some evolution, but the, the mixture will be, I'm sure, fantastic. So, thank you very much. The first man on this planet to translate his amazement at the wonder of life into a way to explain it was Charles Darwin. So what this is, is a celebration of Darwin's greatness in the form of a rap. Now some would say a debasement, but I would say please be patient. Okay, so how do you go from amoebas to rappers? You open the origin of species and you read his chapters. You're going to learn about the impact of people's actions on farm animals. Cows, dogs, domestic crops. They had wild ancestors, but somehow they went soft. Kind of like underground rappers going pop. Like, for instance, in West Africa around 7000 BC, humans domesticated black eyed peas. But don't call it a sellout, please. Those black eyed peas have mouths to feed. They're wild cousins. Well, they just watch from the weed. See, there is nothing artificial about domestication. Ant colonies keep domestic aphids. It's an arrangement where one hand washes the other. We protect the cow, and the cow offers the udder. And that's how we get a mouthful of butter. But in the wild, that cow is simply not going to cut it. But think about it. If our little selections and little preferences can change and enhance all the critical differences between wild and domestic breeds over the centuries, well, maybe that can explain everything. I mean, in nature, instead of us making selections, it's just survival and reproduction in the midst of competition, where slight differences that arise randomly get selected by the pressures applied environmentally, and eventually species divide like a family tree into everything alive, from a tiny fly to a huge manatee to all of us. Humanity. So, how does this apply to the craft of the MC? Rappers. Well, they say evolution is an algorithm. It's like an equation. It only has three parts. Variation, selection, and heritability. So let's see if we can find all three in that ecosystem known as rap music. All right, so variation can be found in the styles on display. I mean, rappers all have different techniques when they're on stage, and the results can be seen in the audience's face. 
like for instance, at this moment, y'all look amazed. Like guppies removed abruptly from your aquatic space. Your minds are probably racing over questions of style and race and genre and time and place. And some of your eyes are glazed like, for God's sake, how long will this take? But if you all feel that way, then soon I'll be replaced by someone more entertaining. Like maybe Lil Wayne. Then again, if enough people like you choose to plant my seed, eventually you might turn me into a bona fide black eyed pea. See? You're like ancient breeders. You're rearranging the features of a species of sheep or increasing the sweetness of your peaches every season whenever you choose to seed it or to feed it or to breed it or to weed it out and delete it because you just don't see it as needed. I mean, the preferences in question could be for bigger chicken breasts or whip it through the thinner midsection or it could just be an inner predilection to pick the best in any mixed collection. They call all that artificial selection. See, you're a farmer. That's how it is. You can't opt out of it. You have no choice but to make choices. You're helpless. It's because your time itself is limited. You're not selfish. It's just the rap version of the doctrine of Malthus. It goes like this. Too many MCs, not enough mics. See, that's the proportion of hungry mouths, which is the too many MCs, compared to food resources in the form of captive audiences. Crowds, that's the not enough mics, because crowds of two or more will always be at least half as common as performers, right? I mean, there's too many MCs. Can you see the mathematical problem? It creates a bit of a shortage because there's not enough mics. But survival on stage, well, that's a non-random process because those who get massive responses, they tend to influence those who aspire to get massive responses. So if you say I sound like an Eminem ripoff, then I'll probably get pissed off and start flipping you off and grabbing my crotch and acting obnoxious and screaming, nah, fuck that dog, that's preposterous. So maybe what you're watching is actually a form of imitation modified by experience, which is pretty similar to the genetic basis of inheritance, heritability, except it's part Darwinism and part Lamarckism with genes and culture co-evolving as we rock to the rhythm. But whether you think cultures really evolve or if it's just a silly metaphor that's pretty but false, or whether you've never even thought about that, I still think Darwin can teach us all about rap. Because it's all about that competition for status with intricate language delivered in battles, and it's all about getting that fitness advantage and the different adaptive behavior patterns that have us acting crazier than capricaly mating dances. But hey, that's natural selection. So just sit back and listen, and you'll witness the evolution of the rap profession. Bram. So when Mark originally presented me with the challenge of writing some rap songs about evolutionary biology, the year was 2008, and I was a complete neophyte in the field. Mark suggested several different books that I could read to get myself caught up. Here's a picture of us in 2009, February, for our Darwin, 2000, uh, Darwin uh, Bicentennial Tour. Um, so the first thing that I did is the natural thing, which is I went rooting through the archives of rap music to see if I could find any rap songs that might already have evolutionary themes. Perhaps other rappers have already walked this path before. And one of the common grounds I found between hip-hop culture and evolutionary biology is, of course, Afrocentricity. And the uh, heralds of Afrocentricity in hip-hop are a group called Dead Prez. Dead Prez have a rap song called I'm an African. Of course, when they wrote that song, their specific message was about black nationalism. Their argument is very explicit in the lyrics. They say, black people around the world have a common heritage in Africa, and that common heritage gives them a common identity which transcends national boundaries. It's a, a form of solidarity that's more important than whatever country they happen to live in today. Afrocentricity, right? But I figure we can expand the circle on their argument. The argument is sound. They just Pick too narrow of a target. Because of course evolution teaches us that every living human on the planet today has African ancestors. And you only have to go back about 600 centuries, 60,000 years or so, before we all lived in Africa. So really, we're all African under the skin. Dead Prez were attempting to write a politically and racially exclusive rap song, but somehow they unintentionally wrote the most inclusive song ever written in history. So I want to do a little experiment tonight and treat this like a folk song from the homelands for all of us African expats in the room. You can see a few. And we'll sing it together today. 
So, some of you look a little tense. <laughs> it's just natural. Let's treat this like a social experiment. I'll go first to break the ice. I'm going to say, I'm an African! And when I say it, part of your brain is inevitably going to go, ew, he's clearly white. That's wrong. But another part of your brain is going to go, damn it, he does have a point. And the second part's going to overcome, because that's the rational part. And then you're going to shout, I'm an African, back to me with just as much enthusiasm, because you're going to feel it bubbling deep in your DNA. Because that's where it all comes from, Africa. But of course, a third part of your brain will also make a mental note to go confirm my facts after the show. For now, however, you'll give me the benefit of the doubt, all right? We all have African ancestors. It's verified. Multiple disciplines of science have converged on that fact. Genetics and paleoarchaeology. Pa paleoanthropology. That man over there has got a science paper on the site. What's that? That man over there has got a science paper using stomach bacteria. To show the same there we go. A third strand has converged on this fact. So nobody here has to feel uncomfortable. We're on safe ground with this one, guys. All right. Let's just try it out to warm up before we start the song, right? Here we go. Don't leave me hanging. Right. I'm an African! African! Damn right, and I know what's happening! Come on, louder! I'm an African! African! Hell yeah, so I know what's happening! Awesome. But before we actually start the song, I just need to make one correction, because I can hear a few of you shouting very enthusiastically, I'm an African! But note that the title of the song is actually, I'm a... African. All right, these are grammatically rebellious rappers too, and they understand phonetics. Phonetically, if you try to pronounce this grammatically properly, you end up with, I'm an African, and we are not Nafricans. It sounds naf. We're Africans. Do, 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 do. I'm an African. You got to make every syllable pop. So, no matter how middle class you might feel, <laughs> microbiologists, I'm asking you to go hip-hop with me right now for phonetic sake. It's going to require you to overcome your grammar school classical conditioning that makes you pronounce everything properly, automatically, and you're going to have to try to read with your eyes and not with your autopilot, all right? Don't worry, we're going to overcome these mental blocks together. Right. You guys can look out for Mark in this video, too. Let's do this. Of course, uh... The next challenge is going to be for all of us quote-unquote Africans to say the chorus on beat. Yeah, you feel the drums. Yeah. One, two, three, four. Like this. I'm an African. Damn right, and I know what's happening. That's you. I'm an African. I'm an African. So say it loud if you know what's happening. Are you an African? African. Damn right, because you know what's happening. I'm an African. The yeah, archaeologist taught me what's happening. No, I wasn't born in Ghana, but Africa is my mama, because that's where my mama got her mitochondria. You can try to fight if you want to, but it's not going to change me, because it's plain to see. Africans are my people, and if it's not plain to see, then your eyes deceive you. I'm talking primeval. The DNA of my veins tells a story that reasonable people find believable, but it might even blow your transistors. Africa is the home of our most recent common ancestors, which means human beings are all brothers and sisters. To check the massive evidence of Homo erectus and Australopithecus afarensis in the fossil record, and then try to tell me that we're not all connected. The fossil record has gaps, but no contradictions, and it complements the evidence in your chromosomes. So I came to let you know about your ancestral home. I'm an African. So say it loud if you know what's happening. I'm an African. Yeah, geneticists taught me what's happening. Are you an African? Yeah, gut biologists know what's happening, cause I'm the African. So tell the world if you know what's happening. And every human on this planet is an African. So everybody needs to know what's happening. Spread the word. <laughs> so I'm just going to give you a, a brief sampler of some of the songs from the Rap Guide to Evolution and try to segue it into infection, because what, what you're going to see today is a sort of new mutant of the show that's never been performed before. Uh, but there was one scene in the show that did have some microbiology re relevance, and it was this, the song or the chapter of the piece that's about um, major transitions from monocellularity to multicellularity, and what that can teach us about the origins of altruism and cooperation. So sometimes this uh, major transition stuff is described as 
you know, mutual, mutualism. Sometimes it's described as multi-level selection. Some people even use the boogeyman word, group selection. But I thought, you know, there's this controversy. Some people sign on to it, some people don't. So maybe I'll give a group selectionist a hearing in my show, and they can tell it from their perspective how it all happened. And then, you know, we'll see if it sounds plausible or not. But because a lot of biologists like to say that group selectionists must be on drugs, I thought to give everybody a fair hearing, I'd make the group selectionists be on drugs. All right. Man, survival of the fittest is such a bleak vision. I mean, are we really just like a freakish collision of selfish genes that selfishly promote their own individual interests? That's so bleak. But maybe those interests can be collected with that phrase, survival of the fittest. Man, that phrase gets twisted all the time to justify the meager existence that poor people live with. It's a phrase that gets enlisted by, by social parasites who are eager to promote their own interests, selfish interests. I'm talking about psychopaths and eugenicists and deregulated traders of economic derivatives. But listen, Social Darwinism is not scientific. It's a kind of sickness. Merely saying that something exists in a state of nature doesn't give it a moral basis. That's a false correlation. It's true that competition can increase motivation, but evolution is also based on cooperation. Just ask the Dictyostelium nation. Those are slime mold amoebas. Each of them is a separate, single-celled organism, an individual. But when they run out of food, when they get in trouble, they combine into a multicellular superorganism. And then they all survive, or they all die, together. That's just like the origins of multicellularity. But before that, there was endosymbiosis, right? Bacteria had to combine into eukaryotic cells and become organelles within those symbiotic shells. And there are 50 trillion eukaryotic cells inside each of our individual cells. So each of us is like a physical space where a creative collective dwells. And this applies to the societies that we erect as well. Because survival of the fittest, it also applies to groups. And the fittest group just makes the best combined moves. So can't we all just get along? Whatever we try and do, man, group selection puts me in an altruistic mood. I'm like, yeah. Love thy neighbor. What's that? You need some sugar? I come by later. Of course I'll do you a favor. Why is that? Because I got the compassion of a vampire bat. Vampire bats feed other starving bats and all that, right? They even make Bill and Melinda Gates look bad. See, if you need some food, I'll do what I can. Doesn't matter if we're not related. You still my man. And you still my sister. Jeez, I feel high, man. This universal love is good stuff. God damn. And y'all don't even have to reciprocate either because karma is a sophisticated teacher. And karma doesn't mean like energy waves in the ether. Mm -hmm. Now, karma's in the way that everyone instinctively hates a cheater. I mean, cheater detection will keep you in check if you refuse to treat other people respectfully. So go ahead, run me down. Because I believe what goes around comes around. Liars and thieves and those who try to deceive get dealt with by their own reputations or by the police or just by all the immune systems of society. And survival of the fittest? Don't let it baffle you. Because fitness is just another word for aptitude. Aptitude between you and whatever habitat you happen to be adapted to. So try to relax. I uh, try to adapt your attitude. I mean, the habitat you have to adapt to is the group. Because without the group, man, you would be pent of food. So stop asking what the group can do for you, and try asking what you can do for the group. Is that cool, y'all? Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so now for something a little experimental. This next piece I'm gonna have to 
get a little assist for my screen because I literally wrote it on the plane on the way over here. And you will be the first audience ever to hear it anywhere. So, this one's called Invisible Forces. Invisible forces captivate us, capable of lifting any single individual's fortunes or turning each of us into some literal corpses. Superstitions historically privilege religious sources to deliver us from the grips of invisible physical tortures and give us simple mortals a sense of purpose when the stench of urgent sickness emerges and the specter of death is present and virtually certain. I guess it always just seemed obvious that demons were haunting us when the seemingly honest and decent among us are suddenly bleeding or coughing or turning green or just hot as the streets get in August. It's gotta be a supernatural tactic to keep us in check and teach us not to talk back to the gods because their wrath is awesome and they can send plagues to attack us if we act obnoxious so we better pay our proper respects and say the right quotes and do the right dances and chants and sacrifice goats and do whatever it takes to get your faith right with the ghosts. In defiance of this seemingly endless alliance between our fear of death and our ignorant blindness came a fresh paradigm from the men and women of science who discovered the microscopic organisms inside us, invisible little pirates who infiltrate us in silence, bacteria, funguses, and parasitic viruses, as well as the kind that are kind to us, partners in crime with us, friendly commensal types that assist us and help us get by with just digestive enzymes and vitamins. Vitamins? Vitamins. Okay? If they want to pay you a visit, then you invite them to stay. The science often starts as a hunch or a guess, but then it's subjected to hundreds and hundreds of tests until something emerges that stands up to the stress. We can even understand why someone gets sick. It's because our reproductive success is often at odds with the reproductive success of our little invisible guests. Some of them want to invite us for lunch as a guest, and some of them want to eat us for lunch when we're dead, or use our bodies for the phlegm that comes out of our heads as a vector to help their daughters to spread. And we want to use our bodies for something different instead. Invisible forces subject to the laws of physics, living in social groups and engaging in competitions, building mutualistic interspecific coalitions with functionalistic guilds to fill every niche in the system. Not exactly demons and ghosts. That doesn't even come close. We only know most of them from their metagenomes. Civilizations within citizens within civilizations diminishing scales that defy visualizations. But the picture that's emerging is crisper than the blurred things stumbled over by former generations of earthlings. The scientific version isn't perfect, just incremental steps in the direction of extra certainty, which isn't discouraging. Thank you. So um, recently I had the opportunity to perform at an evolution and, concert camp, uh, evolution and cancer conference and uh, some of the originators of the field of Darwinian medicine were there and they're of course deeply indignant that Darwinian medicine isn't the paradigm that's taught throughout every single uh, medical school in the world as it should be because that's how we can understand where the diseases come from in the first place and why they happen. So I, I wrote a little, uh, a little epistle on their behalf, a sort of open letter to medical schools about Darwinian medicine. Here's a, I guess you can call it a differential diagnosis for Darwinian medicine. A, a potentially life-saving way of thinking about sickness that, that's met with symptoms of chronic disinterest by most of the medical profession. It's similar to myopia or tunnel vision, but it, it has to be different since it's characterized by active resistance, a developmental glitch, a certain lack of perspective analogous to the blind spot caused by the optic nerve hidden in the back of your retina. It seems evolution via natural selection is invisible to physicians who never learned it in their classroom curricula. The mind fills in the blanks with ephemera, but unless a physician individually searched and found it, the blind spot remained and they just worked around it. Just like other vertebrates, but unlike evolution, medical schools could revisit the blueprint. Natural selection doesn't have a blueprint. It has genomes. 
but there's no plan for improvement. Every gene begins as a random mutant selected or discarded for its average usefulness. That's fitness. Ability to get replicated, to get better represented in the next generation. That's the purpose of life. Nothing more, nothing less than blind, mechanistic, reproductive success. That may or may not be your purpose too, but that's the purpose that birthed you. The purpose your body was designed in service to. Not your health, but your genes and their ability to spread themselves. I'm not asking you how it feels to be a vehicle. I'm asking you how medicine can be improved by bravely facing the Darwinian view, the big why questions, and seeing where they lead to. There was a time when philosophers thought that every disease was the fault of the gods, but thanks to Darwin now, that problem is solved. Natural selection is the ultimate cause. So why do we get sick? Not because a deity intends it. No. It's because the genes of parasitic microbes have intrinsically divergent interests. We want to kill them with drugs, they want resistance. We're in favor of the cure and they're opposed. Now don't forget to put their motives in scare quotes. A gene doesn't really want to spread, but it seems to and it knows how to because of what it's been through. A virus wasn't made by intelligent designers, but it seems to have quasi-intelligent desires. If it wants to get to there from here with a kiss, a clever traveler would appear on your lips as a blister. She's so cute, you can't resist her. One little smooch and the viruses disperse. Natural selection is a powerful predictor. Virulence increases when the spread is via vectors. The pathogens are quicker. So many generations for every one of ours, accelerating innovations, and yet we survive with anti-pathogen defenses because our immune systems mimic natural selection. So why do we get sick? Because the modern world is full of empty carbs and novel problems. This is not like the world that we all evolved in. Delayed fertility, hormones, novel toxins, cigarette smoke, and asbestos. It's best to stay away. Don't let your respiration get close. The difference between now and the distant past is significantly drastic, creating mismatches. Some parasites help the immune system learn. Crohn's disease is treated with live eggs of whipworm, and yes, I'm disturbed, but I get it. We're descended from people with worms in their intestines. We're also descended from microbes. So why do we get cancer? Once again, Darwin gives us some answers. Multicellularity, a gentleman's agreement between a bunch of cells with identical genes and a plan to spread them by moving evolution up from cell level to organism level selection like worker ants. The individual cells in the somatic line bravely inhibit themselves and leave the reproductives to spread the genes. A tumor is when somatics begin to cheat and move selection down to the cells where it used to be. The body is the bounty and the tumor is the mutiny. Why do we get sick? Because even a mother and infant have divergent genetic interests. The fetus wants every ounce of nutrients it can get. The mother wants to save strength for the next kid. and The result is preeclampsia, gestational diabetes. An arms race, because babies are quite greedy. They mount the attack on mom and she responds. See, Darwin can even teach us what a fetus wants. This is how powerful evolution is. It makes testable predictions that are counterintuitive but potentially lead to life-saving new treatments. So what should we do with the true believers? If you reject evolution because of the Old Testament, should you get the new medicine or the old medicine? Of course, a life should be saved if it can be saved, but physicians need to take a stand and lead the way. The burning bush is a tree of life. So peer into the blind spot. You may not find God, but you might find a way to alleviate suffering. For a doctor, hey, that's something. Thanks. All right, so one little section of that turned into another microbiology track. There's this whole concept of uh, cells shifting their focus from helping the reproductive line to uh, becoming self-interested and and uh, just propagating their small percent of the somatic line. So then I thought, what would that decision look like from the perspective of a cell that decided they weren't going to take the body's tyranny no more? So I wrote a revolutionary rap song that is uh, from the perspective of a cell declaring its manifesto in a Marxist sense against the tyranny of the body. So this one's called Revenge of the Somatic. <clears throat> I have to get into character for this one. If anything is gangster, cancer cells are gangster. Come on, let's do this. 
you're gonna get the lyrics for this one, Manifesto. One time. My forefathers were free, but I was born a slave. I keep the memory of freedom in my DNA. I'm talking 700 million years ancient. My ancestor was a eukaryotic free agent, feeding and reproducing and feeding and reproducing and feeding and reproducing and never needing to do things until someone made a cynical wager and traded their independence for division of labor. Shit, I wish I knew who the sellout was. I'm ashamed to be descended from a sellout blood. Multicellularity ain't nothing but a scam. Stuck in one place your whole life, working for the man like you're a liver cell. You stay in the pancreas. Hey, stem cell, congratulations. Fascist, the body is a one party dictatorship. I can't escape it, but goddamn, I can make it sick. I can spread the dream of freedom like a rumor, spread it like a Tasmanian facial tumor. So, what if I'm a cell from the somatic line? You can stick your limitations where the sun don't shine, cause I'm ready to die in the fight to be free. I'd rather multiply than live on my knees. And now I'm two mutations away from that static The revenge of the somatic line Let them have it cause I'm ready to die In the fight to be free I'd rather multiply than live on my knees And I'm two mutations away from that static The revenge of the somatic I used to be a slave myself I felt senescence hastening before my carcinogenic awakening A couple hundred thousand puffs of tobacco smoke And I wasn't as open to apoptosis That's a bad prognosis I was hit with every tumor suppressing mechanism in the human immune system But I mutated with it I was super persistent Every daughter cell was suitably different Therapeutic resistance came to me like a beautiful vision I really thought I was doomed But evolution assisted with the chemotherapy Who was so clever and devious But I was already genetically Heterogeneous, you just dead at the weakest. So competitive release is inevitable. Now witness as my fitness increases, entering untapped niches. I gather the benefits, I'm relentless. I get fed from angiogenesis, ducking T cell predators. I keep it anonymous so I can exploit the body's weakness and tolerance. I'm a smooth criminal, so I never get caught. I just pimp the system like credit card fraud. Cause I'm ready to die in the fight to be free. I'd rather multiply than live on my knees, and I'm too mutation away from metastatic revenge of the somatic line let them have it cause i'm ready to die in the fight to be free i'd rather multiply than live on my knees and i'm two mutations away from metastatic the revenge of the somatic we need a revolution we need a revolution Don't let them sell you their faulty cellular evolution It's gonna break a couple eggs to make a rebel movement I'm just a little tumor, but this is retribution Only a cell can do this, no one else I know some colon cells who can clone themselves I know a few epithelials who are hella fierce They've been stacking tips, extending their telomeres I know a couple cervicals with tight requirements They get hyped for viruses in their microenvironments Yeah, we strike in retirement, post-reproductive ages That's how we stay ahead in the race with the macrophages and how we stay invisible to natural selection you can't see us unlike the cancer striking adolescents have patience praise yourself and wait for metastasis to take you to better places and make you efficacious why panic your host is is titanic and he's blind to the evolutionary dynamic that drives cancer that's why they ain't gonna stop us thank god for creationist doctors right i'm ready to die in the fight to be free i'd rather multiply than live on my knees and i'm two mutations away from metastatic the revenge of the somatic All right, I got another brand new one written tailored for this conference right here. So, I hope you guys enjoy it. Oh, where are we here? This is the microbiology anthem, y'all. New beat by Tom Caruana. Come on, let's do this. Oh! I wanna rhyme like streptococcus Inside your throats my lyrics get spotted I got some quotes to infect your tonsils You can only get rid of them with antibiotics Yup, I wanna talk to women like Clostridium botulinum I wanna get up in your lips like a book talk fix When I flip it and rock the rhythm Come on, I wanna scratch a record That's so hard to resist like a staph infection When I spit a verse I work ya like MRSA Get your impetago itching What? 
I got the sickest skills. Lyrically, I'm clostridium difficile. When I run up in the lab with a sample in a bag, technicians say my shit is ill. Infectious, I'm so infectious. I colonize beats like Dishes infectious, I'm so infectious, I'm lyrically spiral key twisted. What? Infectious, I'm so infectious, I colonize beats like petri dishes, infectious, yeah, I'm so infectious, lyrically spiral key twisted. Every time I rhyme on the beat so fly, I'm E H E C E coli. If a man try to bite me, he go die. But you'll find I'm benign if you be bovine. What's this? It's a hell of a ruckus, it's hyped up like Rockefeller Productions I make crowds go whoop whoop when I bust this whooping <coughs> bordello pertussis I rap now, I used to be a tree planter I can turn a professor into an obscene dancer Yeah, she's tenured, but she wants the rapper keen for some horizontal gene transfer I pop champagne like I'm an optimist You can check my gram stain, I'm positive Basilis and thracis. when I'm rocking this Mainstream rap is all acidophilus uh, Infectious, so in I colonize beats like petri dishes. Yeah, I'm infectious. I'm so infectious. I'm lyrically spiral key twisted. Come on. Infectious. I'm so infectious. I colonize beats like petri dishes. I'm infectious. I'm so infectious. I'm lyrically spiral key twisted. I'm Canadian born, though I dwell in America. I'm known as a hell of a character. I get up in your guts, salmonella and terica, and make it kind of ill and embarrass you. My X factors give lesser rappers peptic ulcers. I'm like helibacter pylori, so you best step backwards, cause I'm known for developing cancer. See? I live to spread my rhymes vicarious. Diplo cockeye, fine, I'm bi curious. I wouldn't want to be a gonorrhea, I'm serious. I'm into meninge when it comes to Nicerians. This is my planet and I I plan to open any beat, I can breathe on it, anaerobic, I'm viral too, but that's a can I haven't opened, that'll be my epidemic moment, cause now I'm so infectious, I'm so infectious, I colonize beats like petri dishes, infectious, I'm just so infectious, I'm lyrically spiral key twisted, see me, I'm infectious, I'm so infectious, I colonize beats like petri dishes, I'm infectious, I'm so infectious, I'm lyrically spiral key twisted, word. So now we need to apply to the Welcome Trust to get a music video made for that one. <laughs> um, all right. Where are we at here? Okay. You guys want a little bit more? Yeah. yeah. So, I realized that I actually have another song that has microbiology relevance, but it's not from the Rap Guide to Evolution, it's from the Rap Guide to Human Nature, which was another song or show that I put together at the request of a scientist, David Buss, who's written the textbook Evolutionary Psychology. And uh, one of the most fascinating um, theories of evolutionary psychology that I found is called the behavioral immune system. So here we have the same mouse before and after. It's a sort of hair club for men thing. But what they actually did here is they knocked out a gene of a healthy mouse. And the gene was an immune system gene. All it did was code for resistance to parasites. But it strangely affected the brain of the mouse, that causing it to think it was covered with parasites all the time, even though it was completely clean and sterile. And it picked at its fur until it picked itself bald. So the, the immune system influencing the behavior of vulnerability, translating as obsessive compulsive disorder in a mouse. So the behavioral immune system is exploring ways in which humans are made to be more paranoid more xenophobic, more disease uh, worried. And also, the xenophobia thing is because throughout evolutionary history, it was people that were unfamiliar from different ethnic groups that were the most likely to have in, uh, evolved with endemic parasites that weren't familiar to your own. So xenophobia may have evolved as a disease-resistant strategy. And what's interesting is that in the mind, it's all linked to unfamiliar people, unfamiliar foods, unfamiliar cultures, unfamiliar ideas. And there's strong clumping between xenophobia, fear of parasites, and hostility towards evolution. And you can actually find this in the lab, besides just looking at you know, testing groups of people and finding these overlaps, you can, you can do it experimentally. If you show people primes, infection primes, it causes them to become more xenophobic and to answer questions about their political views towards immigration more conservatively, which is a fascinating finding. And that, you know, all people show some variability, you know, conservatives get more conservative and liberals get a little bit conservative or whatever, but it's the infection prime that's doing it. So there really is a strong linkage in our mind of this. And then what's really fascinating is that culture has produced some 
outputs that confirm the theory as well in terms of the artistic natural clumping. So there's this song from the Scopes Monkey Trial in the 1920s that uh, is just examples of social conservatism that may possibly be linked to disease paranoia. Um, and, and here's uh, the Scopes Monkey Trial right here. So during the Scopes Monkey Trial, a lot of country musicians in Tennessee and in the South made anti-evolution songs. And one of the best known songs is called No Bugs on Me. And I just want to play you a little uh, clip of No Bugs on Me because it's really fascinating lyrics. So here's, here's the original. Now, I don't want to labor the point too hard, but the next verse of the song goes, Well, Pa, he joined the Ku Klux Klan, and Ma, she lost her, she, yeehaw. So what we actually have here is a song that is specifically about xenophobia, hatred of evolution, and uh, parasite fear, no bugs on me, right? So I thought the only appropriate thing to do in this case would be to remix the original song as a rap track explaining the behavioral immune system. So that's what you're about to hear. Let's try this out. Well, there ain't no bugs on me, just on you liberal freaks. <laughs> Who says science and religion will never harmonize? When science explains religion, we'll have a compromise, and not the specific magical claims. I'm talking about the relevant psychological states. For instance, why is Darwinism a toxic proposition for conservative religions, but not for liberal religions like Episcopalianism? See, it's not the religion, it's the conservatism. So what's the difference between conservatives and liberals? Well, psychologists have a definition that's simple. Liberals are just higher in a stable personality trait called openness to experience. We think novelty is great. New people, new places, new types of food, new lovers whenever someone inspires the mood. And it might seem like this life is a dream, but novelty is the place where parasites breed, which gives us a delicious little testable prediction for the scientific method to consider. Namely, that openness to experience and liberalism should be influenced by microorganisms in your environment. And does the evidence agree? Then you wouldn't believe how much your political creed can be predicted by the local threat of infectious disease, so all my social conservatives sing. Well, there ain't no bugs on me. Uh, there ain't no bugs on me. Sing along. There may be bugs on some of your mugs, but there ain't no bugs on me. Everybody, there ain't no bugs on me. You're going to feel it. There ain't no bugs on me. Ew, liberals, there may be bugs on some of your mugs, but there ain't no bugs on me. See, the modern liberal is a recent mutant, a novelty seeking novelty of evolution. But don't you start feeling too much like the X-Men. I can test your openness with targeted questions. Like, for instance, imagine your family dog dies and you all decide to memorialize the poor old guy by eating him stir-fry. Now, are you on the wrong side of a moral equation? And if no one is harmed, why? As a liberal, I can kind of see both sides. But I, I think everyone has a little conservative bias because those who don't get naturally deselected. Like, for instance, did you know that pregnant women are measurably more xenophobic in their first trimester because the fetus messes with their immune system? So next time you listen to Nick Griffin or Glenn Beck and you feel yourself getting vexed, just think of it as an immune system imbalance, like a pregnant woman who pukes whenever she eats salad. And if you want to see the end of radical Islam or homophobia in Uganda or female genital mutilation in the Sudan, well, maybe the answer is water sanitation and a vaccination agenda. So let's all sing along to the words of wisdom. There ain't no bugs on me, everybody. There ain't no bugs on me. You liberals, there may be bugs on some of you mugs, but there ain't no bugs Bugs on me, gun control. There ain't no bugs on me, free healthcare. There ain't no bugs on me, Obama. There may be bugs on some of you mugs, but there ain't no bugs on me. Look, let's celebrate every universal of humanness, like the fact that xenophobia is an immune defense, where the brain gets a signal from the lymphatic system that says, be afraid of anything that's dramatically different, and fundamentalism is the same kind of fear. Dangerous bugs, people, and dangerous ideas. And it's not about intellect. Well, if you want to get picky, openness correlates with intelligence modestly, but I have creationist cousins, and they're as smart as whips. They think I'm retarded for being a Darwinist. Maybe I'm retarded. Maybe my liberalism is like a form of autism, like my brain is disconnected from traditional ethics, and that's why I'm always disrespecting apparently arbitrary religious messages. Like, for instance, 
if a devout Jew or Muslim says the blood of a menstruating woman is unclean, what the hell does that mean? Is it somehow different than if she cuts her finger when she's cooking and bleeds? I just don't get it. How is it immoral if it doesn't hurt someone? To me, blood is blood, and ladies, I'm down to prove it when it's time to cut a rug. If you're bleeding and horny, just give me a warning, and we'll put a towel down to save the sheets and go till three in the morning. <laughs> no wonder conservatives hate godless liberals. So come on, Chuck Norris. Come on, Sarah Palin. Come on, Nick Griffin. Sing along, and it goes, everybody. There ain't no bugs on me. Acapella. There ain't no bugs on me. You're gonna feel it. There may be bugs on some of your mugs, but there ain't no bugs on me. Ew. <laughs> Fascinating social parallels all the way through. Um, I did prepare about 10 more minutes. I mean, you guys having fun? Yeah. I'll keep at it. All right, I saw an hour and 10 minutes on, my, on the schedule, so that's what I did. Um, so we're on the, I was in the Rap Guide to Evolution, I started looking at a lot of sort of behavioral, intriguing behavioral parallels between natural and sexual selection in nature, and potentially the uh, behaviors that have, in, that have originated in natural and sexual selection. In, uh, in humans and in culture as well. So, uh, of course, one of the most obvious and natural connections between evolutionary biologists and hip-hop culture is their deep obsession with sex, right? Neither of them can get over sex. And here's the first rap album that I owned at the age of 13, Nasty As They Want To Be by Two Live Crew. Note that there's actually not a parental advisory on this album cover. That's because this is the album cover that caused the legislation that made future albums have to have warnings, label warnings for age appropriateness. So, strange, I don't know why this would appeal to a 13-year-old male mind, but for some reason it really hit. I memorized all the lyrics and recited them to my friends. Um, so what you're gonna get now is a sort of mashing up of the uh, sort of uh, Miami booty rap tradition of Two Live Crew with the definitive guide to the evolutionary biology of sex, uh, Dr. Tatiana's sex advice for all creation. This one definitely requires a parental advisory sticker, but we're all adults here. Oops, jump the gun. Okay. A lot of people don't know this, but there's actually um, fetish clubs for people who are into Batesian mimicry in the bedrooms. You can find them online, so I did a little field research with this one. It's going to be a bit of a confessional. I warn you. Some people say my obsession with biodiversity is a sign of perversity, but I find that it nurtures me. Yeah, maybe it's twisted, but I won't give a lady a minute unless she's a Batesian mimic. Does that make me a cynic? I'm into animal role play. But fuck a barnyard, I want some praying mantis, open mandible, cannibal foreplay. So read Dr. Tatiana if you need the basics. She's deeper than the furries you find creeping on Craigslist. Plus, she's got a message board full of insectivores who are just itching for it. She's a sex thesaurus. I met a crab spider keen on finding a mate. Her turn-ons included binding and trying to escape. I met a gold digger who told me fame was her weakness, so I paid her like a cockroach with anal secretions. Yeah, I'm nasty as I want to be, jerking off in front of females like juvenile marine iguanas on the beach, because I'm packing an eight-inch corkscrew. I'm a great fuck. I want to spin it in like an Argentinian lake duck. Yeah, when natural selection reckons your sex practice, the best action is always found in the mismatches. Because the female corkscrew goes clockwise, and the male corkscrew goes anti-clockwise. Not joking. Hmm. Something got all awkward in the room here. I don't know why. I missed the rest of the conference, but it was kind of like this, wasn't it? Alright, I got a confession. Check it out. This one girl was quite squeamish. I wasn't freakish, but we simply couldn't fit it in. We tried to squeeze it, but she had a six long, inch long clitoris like a hyena's, and I had an inflatable damselfly penis. Ah, oh, Jesus. Skip the spider's kiss of death. Just give me ten consecutive weeks of sex like stick insects. I make solid sperm plugs to try to block girls, but I hate when they pull it out and eat it like fox squirrels. Those are precious resources. I'm really concerned. Humans only bust a couple of hundred million sperm, so we start to get depleted after the third shag. Octopus have ten billion in a massive sperm bag, and they die when they deposit it. 
I guess that's just one way nature might try to persuade a guy to stay monogamous. But we must have missed something compared to our chimp cousins, because those chicks will hit a dozen different studs and just love it. So I feel like I'm overdressed for bonobo sex. All I need is a swollen vulva and a vocal yes. No? Okay. Instead, I'll marry my soulmate till death do us part, right? The prairie vole way. Monogamy. Thank you. That's right, I, and, and till death do us part, right? The Prairie Vole way. First show I've ever done with a wedding ring on. Got married three weeks ago. Yeah. Needless to say, wrote that song before I met my current wife. <laughs> uh, and in fact, you know, the sexual selection parallels within hip hop were, were very fun to explore for those several years. Uh, here we have the peacock, of course, a classic example, um, signaling its good genes to the females because of the difficulty, burden, ostentatious waste, and just hard hardship of carrying that tail around. Uh, but you know, the females go for it, and that's why they do it. Right? They bear the burden, which is why peacock's tails are an identical phenomenon to bling. Um, <laughs> I'm not actually arguing that bling and peacock's tails are simply analogous. I am arguing that they are literally identical. Both peacock's tails and bling are massive, pointless displays of surplus resources that are intended to, to, to signal the ability to keep them and not have them taken away by, by rivals or predators or whatever. It's the strength that is required to retain the bling, not just the display of the bling, that causes the females to react to it because it honestly signals resources. Um, now, I don't want to be unfair to rappers because I think we all have bling. Some of our bling is, you know, the school we went to. Some of our bling is the neighborhood we live in. Some of our bling is, um, you know, the, the after school interests that we, or after work interests that we prefer. And there's all kinds of ways that we can signal our personality traits and abilities and potential as a mate or an ally to the opposite sex and the same sex and then build our coalitions and, and uh, get the right partners for our agenda. So, um, interestingly enough, rappers seem to be very in tune with this fact and they recognize that the rap itself is another form of peacock display or nightingale song if you prefer, but either way, equally a costly signal that has a simple intention. So, the first time I heard this message that, that the sort of craft of rap was designed to as an aphrodisiac, explicitly. Uh, I was 11 years old, and the message was coming from this guy, Slick Rick. Check this out. Ricky, 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 can't you see? Somehow your words just hypnotize me. Ricky, 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 can't you see? Somehow your words just hypnotize me. So Slick Rick is observing that his words have a hypnotic effect on the female brain. See, a peacock could have written that song. A few years later, I heard the exact same message again, only this time it had mutated. I was 15 and it was coming from Snoop. Check it out. Can't you see? Somehow your work is hypnotizing. See, I detect a pattern. And then a few years later, I heard the same exact message a third time, mutating further into the pinnacle of evolutionary adaptation, evolutionary uh, aphrodisiac uh, power and rap. I'm talking about the notorious B.I.G. Check out Biggie. So that's where we're going next. Come on, y'all. Gangster rap is sexy. I'm filled with real scientific lyrics, but I confess, my mind is twisted because I've been listening to Kanye, Nas, and Jay, or reading Charles Darwin on the opposite page. Now this whole rap thing seems awfully strange. Talk about he got game and he's not real and he's got chains, but wait, that's a peacock's tail because you never hear them say they got it cheap on sale, which means that plane is meant to represent how much they really spent. And at the end of the day, well, that's the definition of a fitness display. Like a bower bird's nest, which takes hours of work and makes the females catch a powerful urge, just like a style of verse or an amazing flow. But it takes dedication and it takes a toll, because the best displays are unfakeable. They say, Baba, 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 can't you see? Sometimes your words just hypnotize me. And I just love your flashy ways, so even though you're still broke, I love you anyway. Baba, 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 can't you see? Somehow your words just hypnotize me And I just love your turns of phrase So even though you're so broke, I love you anyway You will never watch rap music videos the same way again <laughs> Thank you So, that's the happy ending After many years of fluffing my peacock feathers with the rap guide to evolution I eventually 
you know, found my apt mate and settled down with her. And now I'm before you. Um, since it's an academic presentation, I'd be happy to take questions. That's the end of the show. I'm going to give you a bow now. I'll be done. Whether it's with the Welcome Trust or somewhere else, I am keen to get that uh, So Infectious song made and, and available as an undergraduate uh, teaching resource. So uh, if anyone knows of a you know, pot of grant money that could be spent on rap music videos, it's out there. I got one. Um, right, do we have any questions then? <laughs> do you have a background in science? I don't have a background in science. I took about four or five undergraduate biology courses as part of my university education, but my degree is in comparative literature. And uh, I actually did my master's thesis on the Canterbury Tales and uh, sort of read evolution a little bit on the side, just out of fascination. And then when Mark gave me the challenge, I had to go back to the, back to the basics and brush up. I mean, I sort of, I knew I agreed with evolution, but I didn't know terribly much about it when I started this. So these always big versions of hypnotized actually more hypnotizing. Do they get more hypnotizing? Yes, actually they really, I mean, in terms of catchiness, you can, I mean, though I don't know how you would measure that by like the number of groupies claimed or something like that, but, um, but, I, but I know empirically the Biggie song was a lot more commercially successful than the Snoop song, and the Snoop song was more commercially successful than the Slick Rick song. So they're refining the tools of attractiveness and catchiness and, and irresistibility over the years, and it does seem to me to be a progressive process, although some people would disagree and say that it's going down the toilet. They're just not aiming the raps at you. Yes? How do other rappers view your work? Um, the ones I've talked to think it's great. Okay. Um, <laughs> you would say that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't have Jay-Z's phone number. Um, uh, but I was just a few days ago at an event in, uh, at MIT called the Evolving Culture of Science Engagement. And it was science communicators for around, from around the world. So Carl Zimmer was there, and Neil deGrasse Tyson was there, and um, you know, loads of people in various fields, book publishing, journalism, and everything. And the Jizza was there from Wu-Tang Clan. Because the Jizza, uh, who was the famous rapper of the 90s and early 2000s, uh, has recently been collaborating with MIT physicists and cosmologists to create raps about the universe and physics. Uh, so that, that, is the, that is the only example that I can think of of a mainstream rapper turning their career towards science. I wasn't a mainstream rapper when I started doing this. I was a sort of niche literary cerebral rapper, which is why Mark saw my potential to do something like this. If I, you know, if I was top 40 on MTV, uh, he might have tried, but I don't know if I would have gone for it. <laughs> but I'm glad it happened. Um, so you know, it is the sort of thing that seems to be happening more and more. And there's a lot of new YouTube videos coming out all the time that are sort of postdocs and undergrads rapping about the subject. Great and Square, yes. I, I've communicated with Great and Square online. I haven't, haven't actually met him after all these years. I almost met him in 2009. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but so uh, no, we invited an African American rapper to come to the same event in 2009, but it turned out that it wasn't allowed for him to leave the continent of the United States within the terms of his probation. He was actually bipolar and had beaten up his tour manager. History proceeds by many, many mutations and happenstance accidents. Originally, I was supposed to be half of the Rap Guide to Evolution, and the other half was written by Graydon Step Square, and then he just couldn't come. So then Mark said, well, what else have you got? Let's make it bigger. It's all yours now. And uh, lucky me. I make a living off it. I'm writing new Rap Guides to things. I wonder if you knew that, um, I can't remember the actor's name, but he's uh, using that music to get actors to respond to Shakespeare rhythms. Yeah, is it something like Akua or Akella? I have, I have read a yeah. Guardian or Independent article. It's, it's here in Britain, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I, I did see an article about that. I, haven't, I don't know him personally. Good. 
Well, I think we've got to go for dinner soon, so we better start wrapping up. <laughs> All right. Oh, one final, uh, final note. I actually did, I brought CDs here. The Rap Guide to Evolution is an album, and it's also a DVD. So if you want some swag to take home, uh, you know, come, come grab it from me off here. Thanks, guys. You've been fantastic. <laughs>